Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Beautifully Broken Podcast. We are back with Dr. Dixon Tom. Dr. Tom, how you doing? We're doing really quite well. Uh, I feel I live in paradise, especially this winter weather with, uh, you know, everywhere else being under winter freeze. And we live in Arizona and it's going to be 75 degrees today. So it's crazy. We live on the same <laughs> continent with so different contrast. So I uh, doing really well. It's easy to be great when the sun shines every day. So I'm doing fine. <laughs> Yeah, we went through a freeze here in Austin, Texas, where it was down to like 15 degrees and I, uh, it, you know, very cloudy for a few days. And yesterday, of course, it jumped up to 77 and people oh, were just yeah. walking around and you could see people <laughs> just standing outside, kind of lingering and just soaking up the sun and the vitamin D. And man, you could feel you're like, God, my body wants this right now. How lucky am I have to have a 77 degree day? incredible yeah in january no less so yeah. i know i know it's wild <laughs> yeah i totally. dr tom i wanted to get you back on the podcast because you know since it was it was the i think it was the second week of october i had a chance to come out and actually do the biological medicine for practitioners certification course in arizona at at your center and 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 it was incredible and I I learned so much and if I had to say one thing about it it totally reinvigorated and re-inspired my um my love for health and the body's ability to heal because I was feeling really overwhelmed with all the information and technology and practitioners and and different theories on wellness that I have access to and I was like I remember saying like six months ago, I was like, I'm just, I'm burnt out. I don't know who to trust. I don't know who to look to, but I felt like there were some things we touched on in the course that grounded me back down. And, and it was like, okay, I have a lens to look at the body that feels, that feels new, that feels clear. I'm less confused. Um, can awesome. you speak to that? Have you ever had that where you felt overwhelmed and you got some sort of clarity re re reined in? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and I have to thank uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Gerard Gineau, who I first met in the late 1990s, who, you know, was a, a medical doctor in, in France and who has sort of had, I feel has been, had been ahead of the curve uh, by many people. And you know, I had, uh, you know, I was practicing uh, naturopathic medicine, biological dentistry uh, long before I th it was very popular. <clears throat> and, you know, at some point I remember coming home and saying to my wife, I said, I think I got it. I think I understand what I'm supposed to be doing because, you know, I've been practicing for a while. And then when once I started and hooked up with Dr. Guineau, I said, he's got it. This is exactly what I have been missing. This is the information that I've been looking for of how I can put together sort of a, a healing interaction with, with an individual, no matter what their challenge is, is why they come to see me. And so, you know, when I designed the course and put the course together, the goal was how can I reiterate that type of information so that pa people, not patients, people like yourself uh, who attended the class will go away and say, I get it. Uh, uh, this is the piece that I've been missing. You know, we go to medical school, we learn all this information. Everybody's got the, the latest, greatest and the cure for this and cure for that. And of course, I say, well, I don't cure anything. All I do is support the body's ability to cure itself. And so when we look at the, the simplest tools that we have available that uh, many people have access to because you do it in your home, it's not like you have to attend uh, you know, and, and keep going to clinics here, there, and everything. Because if you're not doing the at-home therapy, uh, what I have found is is that people will feel better, but then they fall away, and two years later they come back, and lo and behold, they have the same problem. So in other words, they never got better. They felt better, but never got better. And I would say one of the things that I try to emphasize in the class is that this isn't about just feeling better. This is truly about allowing people to understand that cure is possible, irregardless of what prognosis you've been given, irregardless of the name of the condition that you've been tagged with, which is really only a label and there's really nothing to do with healing. 
Uh, so, you know, when we look at biological medicine and we understand that what we're really trying to do is focus on the physiology of the body, the biochemistry of the body, and then what does, what does the body, what does every cell in our body require to allow itself to heal? So I don't, I have found that, um, you know, a lot of people go down rabbit holes. Uh, they, they, then they latch on to a problem and not to offend anybody who on the podcast, who, you know, has Lyme disease or who has yeah. uh, mold sensitivity because they're very real. They're very problematic. So my, when, when a patient comes in with that, my first comment is, why do you think you got Lyme disease? Or why do you think you have mold sensitivity when somebody else living in the same house doesn't have the same problem. And so when you start to reframe the fact that we will support you for whatever your condition is, but more importantly, we have to understand your individual uh, biochemistry. We have to understand your individual physiology. We have to understand how your 11 main organ systems function in the everyday world. How do, how do you function You know, when it's 15 degrees in Austin, Texas? <laughs> Uh, or, you know, when you're in the middle of a snowstorm in the Buffalo, New York, or freezing cold weather here, there, and everywhere, like what, what kinds of stressors does that put on your body physiologically for your 11 main organ systems? So I never address a single organ system uh, when biological medicine, our approach is to uh, really address all 11 primary organ systems or main organ systems. And that's, how do we make your organ systems work optimally uh, to whatever level that is? Uh, and that's the way, in my experience of working with, with patients for all these five decades, uh, I truly see what I, I don't want to say miracles, but I truly see the body being able to heal itself. And that's what has been the most exciting thing for me as a physician and why I still love what I do, why I go to work, uh, you know, every day and say, I love doing this job because people start to understand that they have the power within them to do what they need. And that's not their doctor who has suddenly, oh, take this or take that and you'll feel better. Yeah, we can make people feel better with any variety of things, but there's a big difference between feeling better and truly being better and staying better and maintaining choices that you have the ability to do within your own home whether it's what you eat what how much how much movement you do uh what type of uh, treatments you do for your or therapies you do for your lymphatic system and nervous system etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. Be beautiful uh yeah it hit me like a ton of bricks um there was a moment in which i was like oh my goodness um you know this trend uh, within medicine, whatever you want to label yourself as, but everybody's trying to like hyper palliate the signals from the body. You know, we're trying to like just suppress right. it. It's like, well, you know, we can either do that with, you know, a PEMF device, or we can do that with a laser or, but if it's not in context, like you said, if you don't understand how your organ systems are communicating or not communicating, or if they're completely offline, it's like, of course we can make you feel better. But then what's beyond that? Like I went away and there's some things I did post course that have I keep saying to my friends in the last three or four weeks. Now I was I was with you guys in October. I was like, I feel like the I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. Mm -hmm. Like nice. and I've I've been measuring my nervous system and I was like, I I don't get I don't get a balanced score like this. I'll get a elevated score and there's tons of voltage in my body but the balance has been the best it's ever been and and the nice. best thing i can tell you is i've really doubled down with waking up a sunrise i've doubled down with almost almost every day i'm doing a castor oil pack for my liver because there's so many things or my whole abdomen. Let me just pause that. I'm not really doing liver. I'm doing my whole <laughs> abdomen castor oil pack. And right. then and then I've been nebulizing, which I've always awesome. had things that are somehow connected to my to my breath or my nasal pathways or chronic strep throat as a child. And so looking at some of those, the minerals and the humics and fulvics and and nano silvers nebulizing 
uh, as a result, just those lifestyle things that don't take up a lot of time. It's more of it's more of a structure in my day. I'm getting this incredible functionality and other things are happening. I'm like, oh my God, I had three bowel movements yesterday, not two. And like, at, you know, it's, and I, but I'm not treating bowel movements. I'm looking at right. like, I'm looking at like the functionality of my life's design. So I, I just want to join with you and how important that the lifestyle things are. But I was so refreshed to hear you, you know, you, you talked about a case study of, of a young woman that was like over exercising and losing weight and had no muscle mass. And you had sent her home with like exercises to relax and do a <laughs> castor oil pack, <laughs> you know, and she committed and she had all that she as well. I was like, Freddie, you need to do that. So I, I just, I was so happy to hear that people are actually saying like, not only these are good lifestyle practices, but that you want some sort of a commitment from someone and you're building that relationship. And through that, that person is seeing that they have the power, like they can do it. It's not some crazy device or therapy that they can have a lot of gains just by changing lifestyle. 100%. It's, it's unfortunate that because a lot of people will say, oh, this is this biological medicine is too expensive. <clears throat> but, you know, yes, we need to get the ball going started. But once you once you're doing as you just said, what you do at home becomes more important that we do in our clinic, people come to our clinic, and they'll spend a whole week. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll assess uh, all their different organ functions, and then we'll design a protocol for them. <clears throat> and they'll do a whole bunch of therapies, uh, you know, during the week <clears throat> in the office. And then they say, well, I don't have those at home. No, but what you do have, as you just said, I have a nebulizer. Uh, I can move my body. I can go for a walk. Uh, <clears throat> I can do a castor oil pack. I can have a great schedule. I can get up more or less at the same time. Uh, schedule my day uh, so that these are included on an everyday basis. And the reality is, is people, we call them natural laws because everybody's doing them, whether you realize it or not. And and I would have to say in the last year, f from patient feedback, the thing that additionally, uh, it's surprising how many people do not know how to breathe properly. Uh, we talked about in the course that, you know, 100 years ago, people were only breathing six, seven times a minute. Now we're breathing 16, 18 times a minute. Say, what the heck happened in the last 125 years? Like, why are we doing that? And then people start to realize, as you just said, and in fact, this has probably happened five times in the last three months, where a patient will come back and said, I now can tell when my body is under stress. I never was mm -hmm. able to feel that anymore. But by paying yeah. attention and now by simply doing, you know, a breathing technique, by slowing my breathing down, taking four, five, six breaths a minute, I just, my whole parasympathetic system just comes into play. And it's just sort of this stress, this anxiety that I was building up just melts away. And I said, I need to do this more often. I need to do this regularly throughout the day. And eventually the goal is that your unconscious breathing becomes or your conscious breathing becomes unconscious and you don't even have to think about it. And then your breaths are now 10 times a minute because you're just more relaxed uh, in the whole situation. And we're never going to get away from stress because we don't need to get away from stress. We just need to know how can we affect our physiology, as you just said, by measuring heart rate variability, by little tools that we have, people wear, you know, Apple watches or Fitbits or, you know, a variety of things you can, you get a sense of that, that you can do at home and you can see a change. Uh, you know, the other thing that is a very valuable tool that people are shocked about is, uh, you know, continuous glucose monitors have become more popular, especially for, for diabetics. But I've been mm -hmm. recommending them to virtually everybody because, you know, they're not diabetic, but, you know, for $75, you can buy it, you know, a month's worth of continuous glucose monitors. And people are shocked that their blood sugar will spike when they haven't eaten anything. I said, aha, it's a sign of your stress because now we're looking at an endocrine system that is saying, oh, you're, you've just moved into flight or fright. So what we need to do is we need to, you know, 
get all this extra glucose up into your brain so you can prepare for whatever is you're defending yourself. I'm not defending myself. I was just driving to work, uh, which is not really, you're, you know, you're not supposedly shouldn't be in flight or fright. So we have these little tools that are incredibly valuable for people to gain insight into their own physiology. And the more that you have insight into it and the more you pay attention to it, you know, that this whole society that we live in, that it seems every other patient, if not every patient, especially post COVID is, has heightened anxiety, you know, to the point mm. for some people it's depression. And then it's this fatigue. I'm not rested in the morning when I, even though I've slept seven and a half hours, I still don't yeah. feel rested because you're not getting into parasympathetic. You're, you go to bed and you live in the sympathetic dominance. So, you know, we're trying to teach people what it is that they can do. That's really how not only do you make people feel better, but they actually are allowed to use the word of curing themselves, which in medicine you're not supposed to say because theoretically we don't cure anything. The body cures itself, and our role as a physician is just to guide them into the tools. And you said some of the tools are not difficult. It's just scheduling them, making sure you do them. So, you know, find your 20 minutes to do your nebulizer and put a castor oil pack on. Uh, you know, and if you have lung stuff, we put mustard plasters on. So we can do all these at home things that we don't need to be running to the pharmacy or to the doctor. So, oh, I got the flu. What do I do now? So you have lots of at home therapies. Get it. Do an Epsom salt bath. Put warming socks on your feet. Do a castor oil pack, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, this is how thankfully I was raised. Uh, without knowing that th that's what was happening, that that because, you know, my parents, uh, basically, I never went to the doctor with everyday things. We just did these at home treatments. And that had been shared with my by my grandmother saying, oh, you have a, a fever, uh, you know, you do the warming socks and you get in the bathtub. So it's like, so that's, that's, and it still works. And it's been around forever. Uh, and it will continue yeah. to be around forever. Yeah. I, I, there's, there's so many things that I want to unpack from that. The, um, the empowerment piece of, of doing these things on your own. And you start to see this evidentiary proof that like, oh, look, my body can do this. You know, I am feeling some forward movement. I was talking to a friend yesterday. Um, I had a, this happens to me often just because people know I went through hairy stuff that they call me when it's, when they have bad stuff, you know, they'll say, Freddie, you know, I've got, I've got mold. I found mold. I've got Lyme. I've got babesi, you know, they, and they, they, I, I can witness now, I can witness the spiral mm -hmm. and the attachment to the thing. And, and <laughs> right. I, I, my friend was saying to me who runs a very successful, he runs the biggest mold testing company. They have a home test kit. That's very, very accurate. They don't sell a solution for it. They just do the testing just to be a little cleaner. Um, and he goes, Freddie, I've never seen, cause I said, well, what would you tell someone to do if they found they had black mold? Cause I'm so, I get this bias. Cause I'm like, oh, well you got to do this and this. And he goes, honestly, he's like, I've never seen a person get better from mold that was afraid of mold. He goes, honestly, you know, from my experience, it can just be identify the problem. Mold is ubiquitous with this world. It's more about looking at the moisture balance in your home with the target moisture relative humidity. Um, he's like, it's, these mycotoxins don't always move through the walls. It's, it can be more times than not in his experience, it's the VOCs from your house mm -hmm. materials that you've built and the paint and the Ikea furniture than it is <laughs> this thing that we see on the internet with all these other people are confirming your story of why they can't get better. And he sees people address the simple things unwire the fear and then they have this improvement. So it's just, for me, that's sort of what biological medicine and the course specifically did is it helped unwire some of my biases and my beliefs on, you know, the horrible nature of just one bacteria or just one environmental pathogen. If you can speak to that a little bit, I'd love your, your insight. Well, I've never felt that it was a pathogen. Uh, you know, even if we go back to, uh, you know, Pasteur and, Be and Bechamp, who basically supposedly on Pasteur's deathbed, he said, it's it's not the bug, it's the environment. Uh, 
that really is responsible for susceptibility. You know, and in the course, we touch on this whole idea of terrain, uh, internal terrain. You know, you know, mm -hmm. we think of terrain of what our outside, you know, landscape is, but we're looking at the internal landscape of our terrain and our and our inherent susceptibility to. So if you expose, you know, 10 people to the very same, well, say COVID um, per se, why didn't everybody experience exactly the same symptoms? Uh, and and you can do that with any. And so you could say you could have the same tick beat uh, eat, uh, bite ten people. Why doesn't all ten of them get Lyme disease? Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not the bug that's the issue. It's the body's reaction and the body's ability to deal with that that foreign invader per se. And the first aspect of any foreign invasion, starting from literally from the get go from in utero is, you know, how does our body decide self from non-self? Uh, it's really what our liver is doing. You mentioned earlier castor oil. One of the reasons we do castor oil is there's over 500 functions that the liver does. The only thing that people seem to know about the liver is don't drink alcohol too much or you'll end up with cirrhosis in 50 years, per se. But there's uh, 499 more things that the liver is responsible for other than metabolizing alcohol. So the yeah. liver is your first line of defense uh, in general. So I always say, you know, talk to your liver, be nice to your liver. Uh, yes, don't don't overindulge anything, per se, be it alcohol or any other substance for that matter. So your liver is the first line of defense that basically says, do I keep this? Do I not keep this? So in fact, the liver is partially responsible for your immune system. But 70, 80% of your immune system lies in your digestive system. And we look at people's digestive system nowadays, and we see, you know, the Super Bowl's coming up soon. Uh, and there'll be these ads. Oh, before you go to the Super Bowl, you know, take these antacids and take this and take that because you're going to overeat. You're going to feel terrible. So we're going to ward off the problem. So people, instead of using common sense, uh, basically overindulge. We live in a society of excess, especially in the Western world, uh, unfortunately. So it's never the individual bug. It's never just the mold, as you just uh, very accurately described. Yes, uh, it's, you know, uh, even going back to the days of Hahnemann and homeopathy, when he, when before he ever prescribed a homeopathic remedy, he literally went and lived with the, the person he was giving the remedy to for three days, and he looked at their environment. <clears throat> and he said, if you're going to live in a moldy basement, move out of the basement because I give you a remedy. It's, it, you have to do something about changing your external environment while you deal with your internal environment your internal yeah. environment is genetically we'll say a predetermined uh, we all come in with a specific temperament we all come in with a specific constitution we all come in with a specific the term we use is miasm which is basically how your immune system responds to something that's foreign so if one person's uh you know uh way that they respond is to create a fever or diarrhea they get bitten by a tick, they get rid of it right away. If another person's internal environment is such that they tend to be unable to get rid of it and hold on to it, they're likely going to more likely suffer the effects of being a tick bite or, you know, whether it's Babesia or Lichia or uh, whether it's COVID, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what the bug is. The bugs have always been here. The bugs will always be here. Uh, per se. In fact, people are afraid of viruses. We still hear this concern about uh, COVID. And it's, I mean, people get sick with COVID. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in general. Uh, and, you, and you go back into the 1400s, you know, with the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague is like, oh my God, it killed 25% of the European population. But then it stopped. It only lasted three years. Like, what happened? How could the thing that wiped out 25% of the population would be over and done in three years because the body changed. The body adapted. How did it adapt? Through virus. 50% of our genetics is vi are made by viruses, and people are afraid of viruses, yet it's essential for our how we continue to adapt to our ongoing environment. It's never going to be the bug. And so when you focus on the bug, you're going to really get into trouble because you're going to keep looking for something that kills the bug. It's not about mm -hmm. killing the bug. I always say, you know, if you, you know, have a particular bug, 
what you do is you make it inhospitable inside so that the bug doesn't want to live there. So it has to go somewhere else. And the body says, I can deal with this. I'm going to take care of it. That's why we have an immune system. That's why we keep tuning up our immune system on a regular basis. And when people say, well, I don't get sick with a cold or a flu, I said, that's that's one tiny part of your immune system. Your immune system, your lymphatic system is constantly clearing out anything and everything that the body doesn't need, including large proteins uh, that the body says, so break it, you know, so somebody has leaky gut, these big proteins get through your gut lining <laughs> and they say, well, I got to treat my leaky gut. I said, well, what about your lymphatic system? Because if those proteins get across that barrier, how the hell are you going to get rid of them? Oh, they go and block receptor sites. Oh, now I have these swollen lymph nodes. So it becomes this hamster wheel that, you know, you could keep looking back and saying, instead of worrying just about the leaky gut, start where the problem is, which is your lymphatic system that can't get rid of those proteins. You get rid of those proteins, you'll now be able to repair your leaky gut. Yeah, yeah. Uh, amen. <laughs> Double down on that. Um, I want to come back to castor oil because I, whenever I tell people nine times out of 10, I get the sideways like, what do you mean castor oil? Why would you do that? What do you mean put it outside your belly? Why the hot water bottle? I get all these weird things in a, uh, in, in your best, uh, your, your elevator pitch, how does castor oil function to support the liver and why castor oil? Why not olive oil? Castor oil is uh, has a unique substance called ricin, uh, and it's the only the only uh, bean we'll say, and it's the only product in the world that actually has that. And so, mm -hmm. theoretically, and by by definition, what we're theoretically doing, and what castor oil is doing, and what the heat is doing with a hot water bottle, <clears throat> is it's dilating your blood vessels, and it's it's allowing the castor oil to get into your lymphatic system. What we're really stimulating is your lymphatic system, <clears throat> and the lymphatic system is really your uh, the, your cleansing system. It's the main way that our body removes waste products every day that our cells are manufacturing. And so the the importance of castor oil it has been around for over five thousand years. In fact, there's even reports that Cleopatra was a real fan of using castor oil back, you know, in, in, in ancient Egypt, uh, per se. So this, this oil gets absorbed into the, into the skin. Just And what people don't realize is just beneath the surface of the skin, if you could literally take off the cup, top couple layers of uh, cells, you would not bleed. But what you get is this clear liquid. The clear liquid mm. is the lymphatics. The castor oil can get in there, it can stimulate the aspect, it can support the lymphatic system. And so putting it over the entire abdomen versus just the liver is because, as I said, 70 to 80% of your immune system is throughout your entire digestive system. So we're trying to support your entire digestive system, uh, aka your uh, <clears throat> immune system. And from that aspect, castor oil is, in fact, in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, they, they, the miracle oil, if you like, <clears throat> the Palma Christi, uh, Palma Christi, the hand of Christ. And the reason that came up is because when somebody had an injury, they would massage castor oil on and it would heal so fast. They'd say, it looks like you've been touched by the hand of Christ uh, in order to create this healing. So the only place you would never put castor oil is drink it, put it in your mouth. It is incredible. It would cause you to be quite ill violent throwing up, violent diarrhea, but you can put it anywhere on the outside of your body with without immunity. Somebody's, you know, has had surgery. We put it over the surgery site. Somebody's had their shoulder repaired. They have chronic uh, tennis elbow, golf elbow. They have knee problems. Uh, you know, they have lice. It, it, you can put it anywhere on the outside. <laughs> the, uh, the only place, the last place that in my clinical career, that I was very reluctant to do was in the eye. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not suggesting people start putting it in their eye, but I, you know, you have people who have dry eye and they come to using restasis or they're some, using some type of a prescription eye drop. <clears throat> and, and I, uh, you know, one of my former students uh, was an eye doc and I said, what do you think about that? And we had this discussion and he said, it's really, it's, 
it's pretty safe uh per se I said i'm gonna try it uh, so i had my students uh that i was teaching at the time i said okay i want everybody to go home and for the next two weeks put a drop of castor oil in the corner of your eye at bedtime and then i want you to, to come back uh in two weeks and let's let's do a little report so i experimented on my my medical students as often happens in medical school is that the the students become the guinea pigs for things that you are not certain to try with patients anyway the, what i remember really well is one of the students many of them said that ah, didn't do much it was fine my vision's okay one of the students came and said <clears throat> actually it, it wasn't good i i mean i have my vision is blurry i can't see anything she goes to the eye doctor she was wearing contacts and the doctor said what are you doing uh your vision has improved beef and and your your contacts are now too strong which is why your your vision isn't any good but going back to dry eye so once i felt comfortable doing that a patient who had had dry eye within a month her dry eyes had improved about 75 percent simply by putting a drop of castor oil and they're literally it's like we're stimulating movement we're stimulating the 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 you know the the tear ducts we'll say for what's going on the reason we do it at night is because when you put it in, it's going to be looking like through a shower curtain. You have this oil that's that's covering your eye. So, of course, you can't do it in the daytime because you'll have blurry vision. But it works really well at night. It'll clear up one drop at the corner of the eye. And then, as I said, anywhere else, we have people wear castor oil gloves if they have arthritis, uh, if they have a thick calluses on the bottom of their feet, or they have... Uh, you know, any type of foot problems, wear castor oil socks uh, and they can tromp around in the house or they can wear them at night. So I've devised all kinds of ways that people can apply castor oil and it truly, you can say it's the palm of Christi. Yeah, it really is good. And it's just so accessible. There's, I don't <laughs> yeah. think there's a, there's a household that can't come up with you know, whatever a, a bottle of organic castor oil is. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really great. I've got all my friends on a, um, I've asked friends. I'm like, will you do 120 <laughs> days and get back to me? Just talk to me about because what I the one thing I always notice is I gave it to my friend Ben, who uh, he and he said he goes, dude, things are really moving. Um, has has dealt with a lot of uh, mold exposure, environmental toxicants in the past, and uh, that's the thing I, I told him. I'm like, dude, your bowel movements will be incredible. And he said is like frequency, quality went up, everything. It's really moving things through the digestive tract. So. I've got nothing but positive reports and it's one of those things. It's just easy, accessible, and you really don't have a lot to lose by testing it for a few months. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I want to just switch topics a little bit. We, you, you know, we talked a lot about in the course about getting a better understanding of the patient's terrain. Where are you coming in? And, and so we did the first day of the course we got to walk through and actually do some of the diagnostic work and getting information on our body, which I, three of them stood out for me so profoundly. I was like, God, these are easy to get. It's very accessible. And I thought the information was profound. So we did nerve express, which is looking at nervous system tone or heart rate variability, uh, both under a uh, a relaxed position and a stress response and then standing up. We looked at contact thermometry, which which we'll talk about that individually because it's a little more complicated to explain. And then we looked at body adipose index, which I want to start with. I at a relatively simple test, and it's also a test that across many gyms in America, there's a scan called InBody. And it's it's the their most expensive device device, but they do this. They do this body adipose index, which shows you your intracellular extracellular fluid ratio. I'd love to start there and and just ask why we do that test and what is the value um, of understanding where the body is holding fluid. Uh, it's a great question, and it, you're right. It's a simple test. It's uh, many clinics should be doing this type of thing. But you know, one of the things that we know from just general and every is the fact that uh, our physical body is is made up mostly of water. 
So, you know, if we start with a baby, a baby is literally about 80% water, believe it or not. It's like, call it like it's a water balloon, per se. Don't poke it because all the water may leak out, uh, per se. So, but as an adult, uh, males are generally 55 to 60% water. Females are generally 50 to 55% water. So the, the greatest component of our body, even though it looks like we're a solid structure with skin and organs and bones uh, and ligaments and tendons and hair, and nails, et cetera. However, most of our tissue, in fact, our brain is about 80% water. And one of the, just, you know, off course for just a sec. So when somebody is dehydrated, their first symptom is brain fog. And they always say, oh my God, I'm, I'm developing cognitive decline. Am I going to get Alzheimer's? And I said, let's just look at what your, how much water you have in your system. Oh, you're severely dehydrated. So maybe, and they say, yeah, but I'm not thirsty. Well, you need to be down about 3% before you get thirsty. You only need to be down 1% for your brain function to, to change. So the question then is, where is the water? Is the water inside the cell, intracellular, or is it outside the cell, extracellular? And so the, what we're, the main reason we're focusing on that, because we can say around the cells are all, is all this fluid. We call it the interstitium. Uh, in medical terms. <clears throat> and in that interstitium is where everything crosses. Oxygen has to go through there. Your hormones have to go through there. Your minerals have to go through there. Your vitamins have to go through there. In other words, cells talk to each other, but how does it get from cell cell A? You know, how does how does your thyroid hormone go from your neck and your in your thyroid gland down to your big toe? Uh, yes. or to your their fingertip or your heart. So it, it has to go from A to B. And it has to get through this interstitium. So when we look at the diff, where is the water? First of all, are you adequately hydrated? Do you have the right percentage? And then where is it in the in your body? So what I have found clinically, if the difference between the intracellular and outside the cell, extracellular, is not a minimum of three percent, you basically have just that is going to tell me that you have toxicity that is not capable of moving. And I will know that your lymphatic system is congested just from that one simple test. So the lymphatic system, several treatments of that, redo the test, you see the, see it change because we're now able to move the fluid from in the proper compartments. And the more congested it is, and if you think about it like, you know, your lymphatic system is like a little creek and you put a beaver dam in the creek, one mm -hmm. side of the beaver dam, the water flows, the other side of the beaver dam, it's all stagnant. So this is what we're talking about. In that interstitium, you have all this congestion. Of course, you can't get enough nutrients across. So we see 80% of the population is deficient in one mineral. Not be, is it because they're not exposed to it? Or is it because they can't get to the actual cell membrane and the, and the receptor site to get inside the cell? So that simple test of looking at how much water do you have? Where is it? Is that a minimum of 3% difference between inside and outside is a clue that that's going to be one of the reasons. And so instead of worrying about it's the mold or the lime or the bacteria or, or whatever it is, it's like, let's start with the simple thing, move your lamp, make sure you're well hydrated, and we can use a simple test to be able to decide that, uh, which is, takes five minutes uh, to do the test. Yeah, it, it, um, you know, the other thing that, that, that it screams to me is, you know, you often have people that are f discovering health through the body and it, and one avenue will go down is like the supplement avenue. We're like, well, we couldn't, mm -hmm. we couldn't cure it through, uh, we couldn't cure it through, uh, conventional medicine. So we're going to supplement our way to health. And I was like, man, talk about a way to save money. Um, because if you're not able to have that 3% differential to get the nutrients into the cell where it can help and support the mitochondria or detoxification or uh, flood the cell with oxygen, man, you are just filling up your body with a lot of – it's it's almost like just dumping a lot of food in the toilet knowing you can't flush it. And and it's just a bad <laughs> – it's a bad order of operations. I, I, it hit me like a ton, ton of bricks. I was like, why isn't this like a standard? We have to do this test. 
And that's the unfortunate thing because, you know, conventional doctors will often tell their patients that, well, it doesn't do any good to, you know, to take vitamins or minerals because they just end up, as you just said, in the toilet. But if they were looking at the lymphatic system and looking at this simple test, they'd realize why they're ending up in the toilet because you can't absorb them. So it's true that you have expensive pee, uh, you know, and you just pee the stuff out because it can't get into the cell to do the work. So a simple test, easily done. It should be in every office, uh, should be a routine thing that, that people have done uh, because it's a simple thing that you can then realize, what do I have to do uh, in order for, uh, for, for that simple thing? And, and what it will do, it will increase the effectiveness. And we're not only talking vitamins. You know, uh, you can look at your medication. You know, people say, well, I, I've tried XYZ hypertension, high blood pressure medicine, but it doesn't work. I have all these adverse effects. So adverse effects happen because of the drug. But if you take the minimum dose, you can get the effect that you're looking for without the adverse effects, which is really what we're trying to do. And ultimately, in a, in a real ideal situation, you could say, actually, you don't even need to take that medication because when you are moving things more efficiently, you know, your body is doing what it needs to do. And high blood pressure is probably one of the most common things we see in, we'll say, people over 50. And we say, well, you think it's your heart, you think it's your kidney, which is really, for the most part, what doctors are focusing on. And I say, well, that's the last, that's usually not what I focus on. Because in reality, my experience is the reason you have hypertension is because your nervous system and your lymphatic system are not in balance. You put those two things in balance and suddenly you say you're taking your high blood pressure medicine and now you have low blood pressure because your blood pressure is too low because the, the drug is so effective because everything is moving uh, more. So, you know, it's not just, it's anything that you take in, whether it's food, whether it's a medical prescription, whether it's a vitamin, a supplement, whatever, anything is better when you're, when your intercellular, extracellular water is in the right compartment. Yeah, it, you know, this is one thing that we see improve uh, immediately after one session of Flopresso, measuring this body adipose index and just allowing the body to, again, utilize a system that already exists and work that, like you said, the drainage canal, break up those beaver right. dams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, yeah. And then, of <laughs> course, there is the energetics, right? There's the energetics of – I. I I want to speak out both sides of my mouth. I don't want to just say it's not just a system of canals that there's like these mechanical drains. The body's nervous system, there is an ownership and holding that that the, all the tissue is holding and it's clamped down and there's stiffness and rigidity. Many times, you know, because there is an emotional component of not wanting to let go. You said it. Why does one body in a household choose to hold that infection and decide I am ready for some pain in my life because there's something I need to <laughs> – I think it's divine, right? I don't think we make mistakes. I'm like mm – -hmm. the body's like, I'll give you some dark spiritual lesson here to work with <laughs> on the other side. That's, 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 I, I just see it repeat and then um, – you know, on the on the upswing, when the person breaks through that wall, they're like, "Oh my God, look at my my look at my healing potential! It's incredible." You know, it's interesting. You mentioned holding on. Um, you know, one of the most common, you know, this going back to our terrain and those word called the miasm. Just yesterday, I had a thirty four year old female who next week is going to see a surgeon uh, because she's had for her whole menstrual life she's had menstrual issues. So she has on her one ovary, she has a, a, a lemon sized cyst on her other ovary. It's a grape mm. sized cyst. She has several fibroids. She's had terrible dyspareunia. She's had terrible dysmenorrhea. And mm. now they think she has endometriosis. So, of course, we know what the surgeon's solution is. Oh, we'll just take that out, per se. We'll cut that Instead out. Of, yeah, we'll just cut it out. Instead of, you know, and I said, well, you know, that's not really your problem. Your problem is, is that you hold on to everything. And then she started to reflect back as, yeah, it's true. I reflect, you know, everything about her life is about holding on. She does, she doesn't emote very efficiently. Mm -hmm. And if you don't emote and whether you emote through crying or meditation or doing yoga or Tai Chi or taking a walk or a run or going to the gym or whatever you're doing to allow your body to 
express itself adequately, we will tend to just hold on to things. And as a physician, our goal is to help people understand that, you know, you know, their spouse or their partner, you know, may be exposed to the same thing. The spouse gets a, you know, a runny nose and you get a lung infection, same bug. But how come? Yeah. It's because your terrain is different and your how your body has to deal with it uh, is very different. So we need to individually assess people. Not There's no two people that are exactly the same because every even though our genetics virtually are, you know, your genes and my genes and whether it's a woman or male, a child, uh, you know, black, uh, you know, red, yellow skin, it doesn't matter. Genetics are about 99% the same in all of us. Your pancreatic mm. enzymes work the same as mine. Uh, your heart is made up of the same tissue as mine, per se. You know, even if the outside, your eye color, your skin color, your hair color, and all that, it looks different. That's a tiny component uh, of our overall makeup. And we really need to individualize it to what's different about you when we look at this terrain aspect of constitution, temperament, and miasm. Yeah, it is It is so important to think about that. The um when we're talking about these genes or the body types or the differences we may see uh, in another human being next to us, it's, they're so, we're so similar in so mm -hmm. many ways. Um, exactly. Yeah, it is really, it is, it is funny also the process of like everybody, we're all, we're all on this, we're all on this wave of like walking each other home into whatever happens after this life. We're all going there. Right. Um, exactly. And I, that, yeah, it's it, 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 it is a young man that scared me very much. And now I find the more the older I get, the more comfort I get in that. I'm like, we're all walking each other home. Um, I want to also <laughs> go into uh, Nerve Express. Nerve Express mm -hmm. is uh, a, a test that I actually have access to here in Austin because our friend Jesse O'Brien at Central Health mm -hmm. um, does this with, with all his and, – and it doesn't matter if you're a personal training client, whatever. If you want to get better results in the gym, you're going to have – um, you're going to have quicker results if you understand how your nervous system is responding to stress. So I, what is what is Nerve Express uh, in a nutshell, and why is that an important thing to look at? And then we can talk about our friend that I sent to Jesse with the highest score ever right. <laughs> that we saw come back. Right, right. So Nerve Express is a specific type of uh, heart rate variability. And, you know, what people are surprised to learn is, is that every time our heart beats, it's never exactly the same time between from one heartbeat to the next. So what Nerve Express as an instrument is capable of doing is literally measuring the time differences between each heartbeat. <clears throat> and what we find is the greater the variability in the timing of those heartbeats, the greater the, the body is capable of dealing with circumstances that come up. What we find is, is that when people ha are quite healthy, they have a very high uh, heart rate variability uh, between heartbeats. And we measure this on a graph and we can show people pictorially, uh, you know, how, you know, how much variability there is. We can also graph it, um, you know, on a, on a literally a piece of graph paper. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the balance between the sympathetic nervous system which we should be spending about 60% of our day, their waking hours and, and the 40% uh, of the day, which is our parasympathetic system, which is the rest and relax versus the flight fright of the sympathetic. So when we're in parasympathetic, we should be there when we're sleeping because we only heal in parasympathetic and we're sleeping. And we're, so we're healing when we're sleeping, unless you're in sympathetic. And then when we're eating, if we're eating in a sympathetic dominant state, as many people are, they're eating the drive throughs they're eating while they're, they're at their computer, they're eating while they're dry, you know, doing things, which means they're not really consciously uh, digesting food. They're just taking calories in. They're not really getting nutrition. The heart rate variability then is capable of showing people what we call the uh, SDNN, the standard deviation normal to normal. What is the difference on the graph uh, of this? And so, you know, in an ideal situation, that SDNN on the nerve express would be minimum over 70. Ideally, it's over 100. So that's mm -hmm. when you're lying down. Then we have a person stand up and standing up, 
It's the first stress that you experience every morning when you get out of bed. And yes. so the brain says, ah, oh, you've gone from rest and relax into flight and fright because you're standing. You must be about to be attacked. So you're, you've gone into sympathetic dominance. So by lying to standing, we can see how your body responds to the simplest stress that you will have every single day of your life that you get out of bed, per se. And not uncommonly in our patient population, we see the SDNN drops. So their ability to deal with the stress decreases simply because they're standing up. And so, you know, an ideal would be, you know, you lying down, it's 75, you stand up, it's 102 uh, per se, because you have more ability to deal with that stress. Usually when people have an illness, it goes from 15 to five, which means yeah. you have no gasoline in your tank. And I'll usually say to them, oh, you have no ability to do two things at once, do you? You can only do one task at a time because as soon as you're doing two, the brain's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't have the ability to be to be doing that uh, at the same time. At the same time, in the same test, we can be measuring what's called tension index. Tension index, you know, people think like when you contract your biceps, it might get firm. It's like it's it's tight per se. We can look at what your nervous system is doing at a time of relaxation. Uh, once again, ideally, when you're lying down, the tension index should be less than a hundred. So when you stand up. Not a very not it ideally would not go above a hundred, meaning your nervous system is capable of dealing with that simple stress of lying to standing. But as you're about to talk about, you had one that went off the chart. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. ridiculous. Ninety thousand, I believe, was yeah, the number. Yeah, let me see. I've never just because this we'll get some of this on video. Also, okay. I can cut it in. Let me see if I can screen share. So what that's what that tells me is when that tension index is high, what it's suggesting is is that the the nervous system is like a a, a constant amount of tension, and this person is never able to relax uh, efficiently because our nervous system, which is our we'll call it our computer, uh, is the main thing uh, of how we're able to you know function uh, throughout the day uh, in general. So the, the tension index is a great indicator of, of telling people. And so when we point that out to somebody and they start to pay attention, this is when people start to realize, oh, I do feel that I'm under stress because I don't know what this gentleman, I think it was a gentleman uh, who had 90,000, if if he, because as they know, when he was under stress, did he have any idea that he was that stressed? No, I mean, in fact, you know, heart rate, uh, when we did the initial test, and, and I just sent this this human being over, a female, um, over mm. to Jesse, the heart rate, initial heart rate was 97. Uh, you know, the initial tension index was 1600. And then obviously, we wow. go through the stress response and then the standing and heart rate went to 109. Uh, tension index went to 90,000 with an SD and then a four. So that oh, was... My. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but it, it, you know, lots of stuff going on in, in, in that uh -huh. human being's life. And, um, but what we saw was we did a, we did a flow presso session for, I think, I think 40 minutes, heart rate went, um, 86 on the retest and, uh, tension index went down for the, for the laying down, went down to 457. And then wow. after the stress response, awesome. heart rate was 95 and, and 1,040 on standing. So huge shift in the way that person's nervous system was meeting the outside world. And I just was like, man, what great evidentiary proof to, for a person to see, be like, look what my body can do. Like my body can absolutely. let go. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, so wild. That's kind of the value of that type of a test to give people – you know, on paper, a, a piece of indication of what their nervous system is, because they'll then they always say, why doesn't my doctor do this? There is no other test to measure your nervous system. This is the test that will yeah. tell you what your nervous system is doing. You know, you go to a neurologist and they'll do EMGs to see if you get nerve contraction and all that, which is a very uncomfortable test that people will do. It's like it's a painful test. This is, these are not painful tests. These are easier. They're non-invasive. They're fairly quick to be able to do them, but you get such invaluable information that allows you to make a change in your own life 
that basically will mm. have a significant impact on your health now and moving forward. Yeah. Um, again, amen. And the next one I want to look at is <laughs> is just yes. No, because, you know, this is this again. I'll go back to the phone call. Freddie, you know, people every week, it's like, Freddie, I have cancer. Freddie, I've got this tumor. I've got this. And, and the right. first thing, the first thing people are doing when they go into care where they're not sure what the problem is or, or, or where to go, all, all, all people are, are reflecting to me. They're like, well, they're going to biopsy my liver and they're going to biopsy my large intestine. And they're, you know, they're going into organs and, and, and it's kind of, you can kind of tell from what the person is reflecting to you. It's like, wow, they, they really don't know what to do. They're just guessing. They're hoping to find some imbalance or malady in a tissue sample, um, which does not really correlate into overall health. It doesn't give us a lot of information, but the nervous system, bless you, the nervous system that would regulate or the lymphatic system that would regulate your entire immune function would be a really valuable thing to look at. So again, practitioners, go take this course. <laughs> Um, Dr. Tom, let me just grab, uh, let me grab a charger because I do see okay. my battery is low. We'll just pause oh, okay. here and we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, the yeah. magic of editing will bring us back. Perfect. Great. So let's pick up at contact thermometry, which, which okay. I can give a, a little description. So imagine you go into a room and we have a device that takes like 100 temperature points all over your body. Then we take off our clothes where we're exposed to a little cold ambient temperature. And then we retest all the things to see how the body is thermoregulating. Um, specifically around areas like the jaw or the thyroid or our peripheral limbs. Is that, that's a, th that's an overall view, uh, Dr. Tom, how would you say contact thermometry functions? It kind of looks like thermography, but it's a little, it seems more detailed to me. And then we're looking at the body's response to a stressor like cold. So that's the difference between just, you know, some people will, you know, you have heard about instead of doing mammography, they'll do thermography, which is basically looking at temperature differences by taking a mm -hmm. picture uh, of the tissue. So well, we're not we're not interested necessarily in the temperature difference per, per se. That's not what we're measuring. What we're measuring is the stress response and we're using cold as the stressor to your body. So we measure 119 points on the body, as you said, from the head, the, the, the neck, the, the thorax, the, the kidneys, the, the periphery, et cetera. And so we get a baseline measurement. And so from that baseline measurement, we sort of see how your body is under a non-stressful condition. Then uh, we have people take off their clothes <clears throat> and sit in a colder room for 10 minutes representing how does your body respond to stress. Then we measure exactly the same points uh, and we see what happens. And so, you know, by measuring these, all these different uh, tissues and organs, we're able to determine, you know, which organ or organs are more stressed when you're under, so maybe it's your digestive system, maybe it's your cardiovascular system, maybe it's your lymphatic system, maybe it's your sinuses, maybe it's your thyroid. Uh, etc. And so by graphing this, uh, you know, and pictorially for the patient, it's very easy to see that when they get stressed, they don't they don't realize, uh, for example, that their digestive system gets really, really cold. Uh, and so cold, in fact, you're not going to digest anything. 
uh, sometimes it'll be really, really hot, meaning you're in a state of chronic inflammation uh, that's going on, and you don't even realize that you're you have a state of inflammation uh, for what's going on. So by measuring all these different points, you can before the person often even realizes that there's a, an issue, you can point out the, the fact that we can see that you have a chronic virus in your sinus, for example. You say, well, yeah, but I don't have any sinus problems. Well, let's have you do the nebulizer for the next 30 days, and then you're going to tell me whether you think you have a problem. And invariably, they come back and said, I didn't even know I had a problem, but after doing that, I can't, I can't believe how much clearer my breathing is or how much my brain fog has cleared up. I didn't even know it was a problem, uh, per se, because people tend to live in their body and just accept the fact that, oh, I have this ache or this pain or, you know, the fact that one on the side of my nostril, whatever it is, or I get these heart palpitations. Oh, they come and go, but they're, I think it's anxiety, uh, you know. Per se. So we can pinpoint specific organs. We can pinpoint specific tissues that are even, you know, we call it a functional level, because if you do a blood test, you don't see anything because it's not to that point uh, per se. It hasn't broken down into the point of pathology, we say, but it's getting there. It's an energetic imbalance that we're measuring under the, under the aspects of stress. And when you do that, you can so much head off the fact of we need to really focus on your digestive system. But the person comes in and says, well, I don't have any problem with my digestive system. And that's because like with the liver, the liver has to be 80% involved in an imbalance before it even shows up a liver enzyme is out of balance. We can tell you with 5% of your liver, we don't need to wait for 80% of your liver to be a problem. We can tell you long before it gets to that point because the doctor always says, there's nothing wrong with your liver. Well, theoretically you have to, and the same with the pancreas. The pancreas, to, for somebody to become type one diabetics, you have to lose 91% of your pancreas function before you become type one diabetic. So mm. why wait till you have 91% destroyed? Why not say your pancreas is already showing some stress because we can see it on this, uh, on this thermogram, thermometry. Thermometry is using the concept of, I'll say, it, artificial intelligence before we became a popular word, where they take have taken hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tests and say, these are the patterns that we see in people who have these problems. So let's let's deal with the problem before you then end up at the gastroenterologist or the cardiologist or the pulmonologist or whoever, you know, you end up the ENT, uh, where you have these particular problems. And, you know, we can identify, you know, problems within the breast of a female before, you know, it, you know, mammography will ultimately show up a particular problem. So it, it's a, it's, it's one of the most true preventive tests that I believe anybody can do for themselves. It's it's going to show up things before a blood test will show up. It's going to show up even before an MRI, CT, any of those types of common tests that are done in medicine. We're looking at something of creating true prevention, dealing with the problem before it even manifests as a symptom for what's going on. And, and the reason we know we can do that is because we can do the test along with the HRV and the and the body comp analysis. <clears throat> and then, you know, we do a, a series of treatments. They do a series of treatments at home. You repeat the test in three to six months and said, oh my God, it's so much better. And you may remember at, at the conference, uh, one, one of the participants we had done one six months ago, she had a pretty yes. large layer of inflammation in her, in her pelvic area. Did, we did a treatment over those, that period of time with her, repeat the thermography. Oh, and lo and behold, it's gone. The body has healed it. It's rebalanced itself. So we know we prevented something because even though she knew something wasn't right, they, her her uh, gynecologist said, I don't see anything wrong. They're, it's fine. It's like there's nothing here. Well, we knew that there was something on the verge of developing. That's the benefit of doing these types of tests before you have the problem uh, and yes. why we recommend doing it on a routine basis. Yeah, I th I think that's um important to remember that that we don't we don't catch cancer overnight. Uh it's not like catching a cold. Um it doesn't 
you know, the process of a cell from using oxygen to create ATP in 38 molecules versus two molecules of ATP under uh, using the, using sugar as our food that that is slow. And then that creating a mass and its own blood supply happens over time. And, and that you you can see that in an in an energetic imaging. Um, and this is part of it, like all everything we've said, for me, what I hear is, take the time to understand and learn your body to be able to do these tune ups. So you can actually save gross amounts of money at ever having to manage <laughs> these late stage chronic conditions. Because I, I know sometimes people could hear this stuff and be like, man, that sounds like a lot of work. It sounds like an investment. And, and it, it, from my experience, it, it is. I also think mm -hmm. it's the worth work doing because you only get this one body to be able to do however you want to add value to the world. You only get one body. That's definitely true. You, you know, even though people think, oh, well, they do heart transplants and they do kidney transplants and they do liver transplants. And yeah, that's, that's so-called modern medicine. However, uh, you still only get this one frame and you have everything within your power to be able to influence it uh, better for better or for worse. Obviously, in biological medicine, our goal is to influence it for the better, because if you are better, the people around you will be better. The whole world will be better because everybody that you come in contact with uh, will be have a better disposition. Because when people feel better, it goes without saying that, you know, when you feel better, you your disposition is better. You smile more. Yeah you're happier, you engage more, you don't get upset and angry, you don't, there's no road rage and all that kind of stuff that we see happening in our everyday world. Yeah, I can always tell when I'm feeling good, my sense of humor, like the, the right. it's almost like good. how deep I'll laugh uh -huh. uh, at, at, a, at a meme or something. It's like, I'll really go into a belly laugh. And I was like, wow, I'm in a good state. I'm really can, it's easy for me to access joy right now. Um, Excellent. Dr. Tom, I want to just, I know we're at an hour. Last question. You know, we, we said a lot over the weekend in the course, the body likes to heal in order, which hmm. resonates with me. I, and, and, and I think that's why we would get information on the nervous system and, and our response to a stressor like cold and, and look at intracellular, extracellular fluid ratios to understand. Um, but can you say a little more about like, why the body heals in order and what is what does that mean because i uh, my my way of explaining it is that the idea of you know a lot of times we'll do something we'll go out and we'll seek a therapy because we see somebody we're like oh red light therapy that looks great it helps skin and collagen um and but they might want it to help like their leaky gut you know and and what i say is like look red light is adding it's one way of adding the cellular energy potential releasing nitric oxide, but, but we can't always choose to like go up to the whiteboard and like squeegee off our leaky gut from, from red light. It might be that we get less fine lines and wrinkles and that we have less um, pain in our posterior chain or what, how would you explain that the body likes to heal in order? I'll use an analogy of building a house. So when you're building a house, what you, you don't do is you don't tell uh, the roofer to come as the first person. What you do is you tell the person who's doing the, the footings or the foundations to come first. Uh, and then once the foundation is done, then you tell the carpenter to come, put up some walls, then you tell the drywall person to come up, per se. So you have to do it in a specific order. In order for the body to heal, as based on you know this and our previous podcast, what we know is, is that you have to have the basic physiologic functions working before you ultimately are able to rebuild uh, uh, the home. So the, uh, the, and we talk about in the course, and we've talked about these previously, uh, what we call our primary among trees. We've talked about a lot today, the lymphatic system. Uh, so we hear people, I hear people all the time saying, uh, oh, I'm treating this Lyme, I'm treating it with XYZ, and then the person has a reaction and they say, oh, you had a Herxheimer reaction. I say, well, isn't that interesting? I've never had a Herxheimer reaction ever with any patient. And the reason I haven't had it is because if you suddenly dump all this toxicity into an extracellular space that is, that, that is not at least 3% less than the intracellular, you just further put more garbage into a space the brain says, I don't know what the hell to do with that. And then you start getting all these symptoms. 
if you don't have your lymphatic system working before you start any treatment, you're going to have a very difficult time healing uh, for, for what's going on. So, and so, yeah, before you heal your leaky gut and you have all these big molecules that have crossed, if you have a lymphatic system, if you heal it up, where the hell is the, where's all this big proteins going to go? You've got to do it in the order that the body knows it can get rid of things. Your, your kidneys have to be working efficiently to get rid of the waste. You're, you have to be learning how to breathe properly so the volatile waste you can breathe out. Your colon has to be working properly. Your liver has to be working properly. And absolutely, your lymphatic system. I can't emphasize the importance of castor oil, dry skin brushing, moving your body on a regular basis to keep that lymphatic system moving. And, you know, the first, uh, you know, you mentioned the case that I talked about in the course. If you don't, that's, you have to do simple things. The more complicated the case, the simpler has to be the treatment because it's don't go doing a whole bunch of treatments because you're just going to feel worse uh, from doing it because the body doesn't know what you, it's like mobilizing. People say, oh my God, I got all, I did a, a urine test or a heavy metal test and I got all these, I got mercury and lead and arsenic. I got to get rid of it. They go for some type of chelation. They feel 50 times worse because they can't get rid of it. Because, oh, I forgot to tell you I was constipated. Don't do any type of detox if you have constipation because you're going to get worse. And people go, oh, that's a Herxheimer reaction. No, that's not a Herxheimer reaction. That's a lymphatic congestion problem and an amongtry problem. That's why we have to heal it in the proper order that allows the body to heal it. And then people say, well, it takes so long. I said, I can't, I can't uh, excuse the fact that the body has a preferential way of healing. It'll only heal in the order that's necessary. Just like you can't build the house by having the painter and the roofer come first before you actually build the walls. Let's get our primary monk trees working efficiently, then start doing your red light therapy, then start doing your other therapies, because at that point, you're going to see this dramatic improvement at, without having adverse reactions. And I think that's the biggest one of the most common errors that medicine makes is they force, they try and force the square peg through the round holes. I going to get that, uh, that red light is going to work no matter what. And it's like, but I didn't really feel anything. It didn't really help me that much. And you spent all this money. And I said, no, get, get your primary among trees working, get your, your, your bare bones, follow the natural laws, get those in place. And that's why they're there forever. Every person on this planet, all 8 billion of us, have to do the same thing every day. We have to have one of water, we have to have food, we have to move, we have to breathe, et cetera, et cetera. Those have yeah. to be in place efficiently to really heal with all these great therapies that are available out there. Yeah. And so, you know, with that, Dr. Tom, the, 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 I think the biggest thing that, that, you know, I have on my social media platforms and I've been talking, it's like, I'm not a doctor. You know, sometimes I feel a little lost. It was like, how am I helping, you know, uh, having conversations with people like you. Um, but the one big thing I took from the course is this idea to educate, empower, and inspire. And mm -hmm. anybody can do that. And like, for me, uh, understanding there is an order of operations to healing, that we have these pathways in the body that have to be honored. We can't bypass them right? Even though we want right. to, we want it to be quick. We got to go back and we have to educate and we have to, and we have to inspire our own behavioral changes at home. And what a great way to help people be a participant participant in their own improvement is this model of biological medicine. So I just want to do a huge call out to anybody who feels frustrated and you're tired and you're overwhelmed. Okay. Um, that this was, uh, it, our goal is to fill the course, <laughs> in in the spring right. and and I just you know it's there's a lot of there's probably 14 hours online and then there's a, a weekend with Dr. Tom you go do all the therapies you get your hands dirty and not literally but you know you get to try everything and see what it feels like and you know there's there's um there's so much value there I just want to I, I really want to call it in energetically that we get a bunch of great practitioners learning this way of looking at the body, slowing down, and also um, understanding how they can build a practice that doesn't drain their energy and their life force. Because that's that's another big thing that I, I hear reflected to me. So I, um, yeah, thank you for doing what you're doing, Dr. Tom. I thought the course was absolutely like a 10, 10 stars. 
if I were only given four stars. It's just, it's awesome. <laughs> well, I appreciate the feedback and I appreciate your willingness to come and experience that and then be able to share it with your all your podcast listeners. Because, you know, the goal is, is that people in all parts, you know, of the con country or the continent for that matter, can go into their local neighborhood and find somebody who has some of these mm -hmm. tools and is looking beyond just, you know, going to their, their primary care doc and saying, well, there's, we can't do anything for you. You need to go to this or that person. Unfortunately, simply because they don't have the tools or the understanding uh, or the ability to do what amounts to simple non-invasive tests. You know, you know, they're not painful. We can do them on anybody. Uh, they're, you know, they does take a couple of hours, we'll say, to do all the tests, but uh, it's small, small piece of time, uh, ultimately, to get information. Then what I've heard the most is, I've never been told this type of information before. I said no because nobody's been doing it, and your your general practitioner certainly has not been doing it. You just rely on simple blood tests, the CR, uh, and X-rays, and you know, imaging. You don't see energetic changes before they show up without these types of tests and without this understanding of straight physiology. You know, we're really not trying to treat your symptom. We're trying to help you understand why you have the symptom. And that is the biggest difference with biological medicine. Even then functional medicine, I would say. Functional medicine, you know, does a lot of tests and they look at the moment. But, you know, my experience is they're still not looking at the bigger picture of but what is the physio? Oh, you have, you need amino acids. You need this nutrient or that. I said, but why? Why do you need it? It's because your receptors are blocked, because your, inter your interstitium is blocked, your lymphatics. What is the underlying reason? And without these types of diagnostics, I don't have any idea how you would be able to garner that information. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have Dr. Tom back again in the future, I'm sure, because there's like, a hundred questions that came up from this one. I thought I would get everything answered and I just, uh, it, it, it continues because it's very ins inspirational to me just to like every layer I garnish. I am, a am a better podcaster. I'm a better interviewer from understanding the body in this way. So, um, Tom, thank you for being a guest. It was my pleasure again. Well, it's my pleasure to be part of the podcast, uh, Freddie. So anytime we, we will continue yes. the, the conversation, we'll say. Definitely. We'll have to continue it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Big love. All right. All right.